This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Pleasure to introduce our student today, Marcella Cheverri, uh, at, um, currently at Yale University, uh, where she's an assistant professor. Uh, she did her PhD in um, NYU in uh, 2008, mm-hmm. and her book uh, will be coming out very soon in April. Maybe? It's 28th of March. 20th of March, so very <laughs> soon. Supposedly. Very, very soon we yeah. will have uh, Marcella Chavez's first book, but today she will speak about her, her new project. So we're all very, very excited to listen to her. Great. Well, thank you all for coming, and thank you especially to the organizers for having me today uh, here with you. Um, it's especially uh, nice for me because I, uh, I just arrived in London last week, for a one month uh, trip of research. And so it's really nice to see uh, old friends and colleagues that I wanted to get in touch with anyway. And on the other hand, also to be able to speak to you about my new project uh, that is uh, obviously, or or thankfully following uh, the the ending of the first book project that as Natalia said, is coming out uh, at the end of this month. So it's really, a wonderful stage for me to be beginning uh, this research on basically uh, the title of the of the paper describes more or less what I'm doing and it's slavery and anti-slavery in the Spanish American republics during the 19th century. In 1821 after a long war against Spain a constitutional congress was established in Cúcuta with the aim to recreate the Republic of Colombia which would integrate Venezuela and the Viceroyalty of New Granada, including the Quito and Panama Audiencias. The law of July 21, 1821, sanctioned under the Cúcuta Constitution, decreed the abolition of the slave trade and a free womb law. This was, no doubt, a progressive move on the part of the Colombian legislators. It was also a clear result of the mobilization of enslaved people in the armies fighting for independence, and it moreover reflected a commitment on the part of elites such as Simon Bolivar to the abolition of Atlantic slavery. It aligned with the Haitian Revolution, both in the principles of republicanism and anti-slavery, and with the British monarchy's campaign to stop the African slave trade. Yet, after the 181 Constitutional Congress, the Republic of Colombia underwent serious crises that led to its dissolution in 1830. And though the resulting republics of Ecuador, New Granada, and Venezuela continued to uphold the legal framework that was driving their societies and economies out of slavery, the institution did not end in either of these nations until the early 1850s. 1852 in New Granada and Ecuador, and 1854 in Venezuela. Though the recent scholarship on the wars of independence in Latin America has brought attention to the links between that military and political process of the wars and the mobilization of enslaved people, and here I'm thinking mainly of Peter Blanchard's book Under the Flags of Freedom. For the Spanish American mainland, the politics of the abolition of slavery before and after independence is still a question largely unexplored. In part, this is a result of the prevalent supposition that British diplomatic pressures paved the way for abolition in the emerging republics across the region. Indeed, the history of freedom in the Atlantic world is generally, or is still, portrayed as as especially tied to Anglo-Atlantic liberalism. And though British involvement in the dismantling of the slave trade and slavery is unquestionable, there are a number of important questions that need to be explored in order to understand why and how slavery ended in Spanish America when it did. This implies asking and embracing the following questions. What happened between the three decades from 1821 to 1854 and 52? Who was involved in defending slavery and which sectors leaned toward abolitionism? What was the political and economic rationale behind each of these sides? 
the research project on which I am currently embarking seeks to answer such questions and to further explain how, focusing on Gran Colombia, and later in present day Panama, Ecuador, Venezuela, and Colombia, we can show that rather than seeing mainland Spanish America as peripheral to the history of Atlantic slavery and anti-slavery, historians should consider the region as the epicenter of larger historical dynamics that shaped the meaning of freedom in the American continent. The project, as I have envisioned it, has many levels and implies a variety of challenges that I want to present to you today, and I really look forward to your feedback and suggestions on these goals. The analytical outline of the challenges is as follows. First, to reconstruct the history of Gran Colombia, that is, to rethink the history of Venezuela, Colombia, Panama, and Ecuador outside of the nationalist histories that prevail and that represent the decade from 1820 to 30 erroneously, because they don't take seriously the process of creation of a larger <coughs> confederate republic in North and South America. The second challenge is to combine constitutional and social history, that is, to articulate the views and political means of slaves, free blacks and Indians, with those of the local and cosmopolitan elites on the issues of slavery and abolition. The third challenge is to place Gran Colombia, and later Venezuela, Ecuador, and New Granada, in an Atlantic space, where during the 19th century, pro- and anti-slavery ideas and forces circulated and clashed. The fourth challenge, as I see it, is to revisit and reconsider the generalized equivalence between republicanism and abolitionism in Latin America. A fifth challenge is to recover the ideological and material ground of elite and popular abolitionist projects or movements in Gran Colombia as a case study in mainland Spanish America. And finally, historiographically, I see as a challenge to engage in the current discussions about the second slavery from the perspectives of Gran Colombia and mainland South America. And I will say more about the second slavery in a moment. My contributions in this uh, regard include at least two points. The first one is to combine seemingly disconnected chronologies of the history of the economy and politics of slavery in the Atlantic world. And the second is to identify links between the abolition of slavery and indigenous labor and show how understanding the particularities of the Andean region can transform the debate on abolition. Okay, so. I want to start by developing the question uh, about what we know in terms of Latin American abolition. And here, the first important point is to highlight that most of the historiography on Latin American abolitionism concentrates on the late 19th century, particularly on the cases of Cuba and Brazil. I personally believe that it is conceptually critical to understand the causes and effects of this geographic and chronological bias, because it is the corollary of a plantation-centric historiography that, perhaps unintentionally, draws a line between the rise of sugar, cotton, tobacco, and coffee plantations in the 17th century and the final abolition of slavery in the Atlantic world between the 1860s and 80s. Um, and as an example, here I want to note that Seymour Drescher, who recently produced the most comprehensive compendium to the history of abolition, has a short chapter on Latin America which only focuses on Brazil and Cuba, excluding the, west, the rest of this region of Latin America. I think we should be worried about such an omission. Thus, we know much about the history of slavery and abolition in the most exceptional cases, and much less about the circumstances that influenced other regions and societies in which slavery did not grow exponentially during the 19th century, mainly the Spanish-American mainland. The studies of Brazil and Cuba have laid the ground for important discussions about the links between liberalism and slavery during the 19th century, 
but they have kept the discussion within the bounds of the dyad, colonialism and monarchy on the one hand, and slavery on the other. Conversely, the history of the end of slavery in most Spanish American republics has been written as an appendix of the rise of republican states. Slavery was abolished as a consequence of the emergence of citizenship, yet the legacies of slavery, in turn, are portrayed in this version in constant conflict with the principles of racial harmony. It's possible to identify, and identify two broad tendencies in the balances that historians have made of the end of slavery in Latin America. On the one hand, it's considered to be a region that pioneered in questioned, questioning human bondage, and as you probably know, Simon Bolivar tends to get credit for it and to be considered as a champion of humanitarian laws and processes in the hemisphere. On the other hand, historians have also established a tradition that is very critical of the laws and the sentiments of the elites that proclaimed them, to a degree of arguing that while abolition did begin with the rise of republican institutions, the laws were strategically sabotaged from many sides to an extent that they became inactive as a result. Here, Bolivar is rather seen as a hypocrite. And there is an accompanying argument to this discrediting of the abolitionist gestures, that, in fact, slavery was in decadence in the Spanish mainland since the 18th century, so considering dismantling it was not an especially meritorious action. And I will return to this debate in a moment. As a rule, studies of abolition across mainland Spanish America have had a national f nationalist focus. That is, in the case that I'm interested in, for example, historians have separated Venezuela from Ecuador and these from Colombia. This anachronistic approach that ignores the Gran Colombian period and project, I argue, is problematic for a significant substantial reason that, as we have seen, slavery was a core issue in the constitutional, economic, and social project of the Colombian Republic. At the economic and social levels, for example, Gran Colombia was an ambitious attempt to unite three very disparate regions. At the eve of independence, Venezuela, the foremost Caribbean region of Gran Colombia, held the third largest population of slaves in Latin America, after Brazil and Cuba. And it had developed an economic project closest to the plantation economies of the Antilles, mainly in the provinces of Caracas and Maracaibo. New Granada had also an important economy based on gold extraction that was performed by enslaved people in the western provinces of Chocó, Antioquia, and Popayán. In the Audiencia of Quito, which later became Ecuador, Slavery was mainly important around the Chota Valley, where cane was produced and it was uh, managed by Jesuits, and Guayaquil, where slaves were mostly involved in the shipyards. So clearly the slaveholding elites that emerged in such divergent economic backgrounds had given way to different ideological landscapes. I'm currently exploring the participation of these regional economic elites in the Colombian constitutional project and particularly their engagement in the debates about slavery and abolition. Here, it's possible to differentiate between two levels of engagement. One is the economic and the other the moral one. The historiography has until now produced an interesting assessment of the prevailing logic that the reduced number of slaves and the lack of plantations across South America was the cause for such abolitionist measures. But this explanation naturalizes abolition, once more, based on two assumptions, that those elites, elites held an economic rationale that could foresee the impossibility of combining slavery with activities other than plantations, and that slavery was mainly an economic issue and not a political one. I argue that the first assumption is problematic because it stems from the plantation-centric paradigm, and the second one is honestly based on an outdated view of slavery as a one-dimensional institution. As you all know, historians have revised that view, and today we insist on the need to explore the links between slavery and politics, 
both at the level of state formation and at the level of the subjectivity of the enslaved. In other words, slaves were not just things or laborers, but they also had a legal and political dimension. Mm. Okay, so let me move now, uh, somehow zoom out a little bit and move into what I find to be the links between this case study and the Atlantic historiography. I have mentioned that the historiography on abolition is mainly Anglo-centric, which means that the main actors in the story are generally the British and North Americans whose moral crusade was successful in ultimately transforming the Atlantic economy from slavery to capitalism. This, of course, is a simplified way of putting it, but it's useful for f the following points that I want to make. The most recent, recent reassessment of the history of slavery in the 19th century has challenged the presupposition that slavery and capitalism can be placed in an evolutionary timeline. And by focusing on the histories of Cuba, the US South, and Brazil, historians like Dale Tomich, Rafael Marquese, and Ada Ferrer argue that the 19th century was not, was not just the century of anti-slavery, as it was generally seen from the British perspective, but it was also the moment of the rise and massive expansion of the second slavery. The most important aspect of the second slavery is that it produced a huge and technological and ideological transformation in slavery, whereby slave labor and the product of massive plantation economies were articulated to the emergence of a global industrial and financial economy. Indeed, in the context of the rise of liberalism and of the principles of equality, the slave societies of the second slavery also had to redefine bondage, and that was done by justifying in new terms the economic relevance and the social grounds for inequality and exploitation through slavery. This structural model that questions the natural distinction between slavery and capitalism, or slavery and liberalism, is very valuable. It grows out of a sophisticated understanding that slavery, to use uh, the term of Schmidt Nawara, was characterized by its flexibility and ad adaptability through time. In this regard, I engage this historiography on the second slavery and take those premises seriously by incorporating mainland Spanish America to the debate about slavery's protean nature. I do so by seeking not only the differences between Gran Colombia and the core second slavery cases, but also the connections among these cases and regions. So let me start with the issues of the differences. I have already mentioned that the fact that in Sp the Spanish-American mainland, generally there were no plantations. But that fact should not be an argument to exclude it from the history of slavery in the 19th century. The dangerous consequences of such an exclusion have been noted, for example, in the African diaspora historiography that points to the variety of African descendant communities which exist across the Americas as a product of uneven flows of Africans brought from different places at different times. Alex Boruki, David Eltis, and David Witt, for example, also developed this argument in their recent, recent AHR article in which they call attention to the fact that the history of the Atlantic slave trade must take such variability seriously. Another crucial difference that weighs heavily on the importance of studying mainland South America and especially places like Colombia or Venezuela is that in these societies, free people of African origin and descent proliferated as a result of the legal practices instituted by the Spanish monarchy. Certainly this is a significant fact when one considers that up to 30% of the population in the Colombian Republic was free and of mixed race at the moment of independence. This in itself is an important reason to account for the place of those freed people in the genealogy of freedom across the Americas. <coughs> 
The connections between the second slavery economies and mainland Spanish America is another area that needs to be explored and which I have begun researching. First, a word on why connections matter. At the most basic and obvious level, nationally or imperially bounded histories are not always appropriate or generative. The case of Gran Colombia is itself an opportunity to think outside contemporary national frames, not just because it implies looking at Venezuela, Colombia, Panama, and Ecuador together, but also because the diplomacy of the Colombian statesmen was vitally linked to republics all across the hemisphere. And I literally mean Mexico, Central America, Rio de la Plata, Chile, Peru, Haiti, and so on. <coughs> Therefore, it's absolutely necessary and enriching to account for such influences, relationships, and in some cases antagonisms to understand the economic and ideological contours of the emer emergent Latin American republics in the 19th century. Specifically, my project explores two sets of connections with the strands of British, US, Mexican and Haitian abolitionism on the one hand and with pro-slavery forces in Brazil, Cuba and Spain, Peru and the US on the other. This means acknowledging that the Colombian abolitionist project did not emerge or evolve in a vacuum. That just as the second slavery regions embarked in redefining slavery economically and also reimagining the arguments in favor of slavery ideologically and morally, pro-slavery elites in Colombia were doing the same thing. And they were doing so by establishing links to that broader contemporary reality of the simultaneous growth of Atlantic slavery and anti-slavery. Here, again, the prevailing equivalences between colonialism and monarchy on the one hand and slavery on the other, and republicanism and anti-slavery on the second uh, equivalence, need to be interrogated, because not all elites within the emergent republics saw slavery as incompatible with the creation of republican states. And this, of course, should not be surprising entirely, because it's also the case uh, of the United States. Mm. So I will add a few words to offer some conclusions about how the project is reframing the boundaries of abolitionist histories and redefining the actions and goals generally included in the 19th century anti-slavery aside from rethinking the better links, uh, the better known links with British abolitionism. The current paradigms of abolitionism in the Atlantic world are first, British diplomatic and civic abolitionism, second, the Haitian-centered notion of slave rebellion, which shifts the focus from enlightened publics to the incidence of radical Afro-diasporic politics in the destruction of slavery, and third, the gradual abolition laws of Spanish America, stemming from the military dynamics of the independence wars. Now, this last paradigm, that is the Spanish American uh, abolition laws, is not generally included in broader histories of abolition, as I have mentioned, but it's, it's in the process of becoming recognized. However, I should mention that the current definition of abolitionism is strictly linked to the British experience, as you will find for example, in Robin Blackburn's book, American Crucible. Blackburn says, and I quote, the Spanish-American emancipation laws of the 1820s were not the product of abolitionist movements. Underlying this statement is the differentiation between the terms anti-slavery and abolitionism. Is this differentiation useful? Differentiation useful. I believe the case of Gran Colombia is a very good testing ground for this <coughs> question. It will allow us to look deeper into the history of abolitionist thought among people in Spain and Spanish America, and to challenge the current exclusion of Spanish America from the history of abolition, abolitionism. And I want to acknowledge that this field of the history of anti-slavery in the Spanish Empire has become stronger thanks to the work of scholars such as Chris Schmidt-Nawara and Emily Berquist, among others. 
I believe that we just don't know enough to explain the 1820s emancipation laws out of any other source than the contingency of the wars of independence or the influence of Britain on Haiti. Yet deeper research into the developments in places such as Antioquia, for example, can yield interesting elements for rethinking that existing version. Back in 1813, a man called Jose Felix Restrepo drafted the first proposal of a partial reform to gradually abolish slavery in the province of Antioquia. Uh, and those of you who don't know where Antioquia, Antioquia is, it's in co contemporary Colombia. In 1814, Juan del Corral, president of an autonomous junta in Antioquia at that same time, turned the proposal into a law. Del Corral justified this radical project referring to the Chilean law of 1811 that abolished the slave trade and instituted a free womb law. So here we see an example of the importance of paying attention to the flow of ideas and institutional examples among South American regions and not just from the North Atlantic. Though Del Corral's legislation was not taken to its ultimate consequences in part because of the monarchical restoration, and just like the Cucuta law in 1821 was only slowly put into practice, the origin and impact of such abolitionist thinking in Antioquia, New Granada more broadly, Ecuador, and Venezuela need to be researched and understood. Again, the fact that since 1813, many statesmen across the territories that would become Gran Colombia were officially liberal and hum humanitarian, yet also sustained both an active and passive resistance to the final abolition of slavery is a very interesting problem. Where did the liberal tendencies come from? Were they grounded on the declining state of slavery in these regions? Mm, on the other hand, was the resistance grounded exclusively on slave owners' economic interest to receive compensation from the government? Finally, to locate the anti-slavery ideas and actions only among the elites is, in any case, insufficient. To cite Blackburn again, it's clear that the concept of emancipation presupposes the existence of an emancipator. So here's the last point I'd like to make, though definitely not the least important. You will recall that Spanish America had around 30% of free population, many of whom were free blacks. How do these people connect to the process of abolition? One way to look into this question is from the public sphere perspective that emphasizes a political and moral movement such as the one found in the British world. Or we could seek for an armed struggle against slavery like the one in Haiti, as for example Aline Helg has done. Both are possible because there were sectors of the elite and popular classes that rejected bondage and the enslaved themselves, we know, performed actions against slavery and enslavement. But another alternative that suits this case, I think, is to include the free populations in an economic and political history of freedom across Latin America and the Atlantic world. Free people of African descent had carved spaces of freedom during the colonial period, and these left marks on the labor structures of such regions. By escaping forced labor, <coughs> free people themselves became actors in the rise of free labor practices, and in inhabiting the spaces of free laborers, they also shaped the economic dynamics of production. This was particularly the case in places like Venezuela, Cartagena, or Antioquia. Similarly, indigenous people were core actors in the evolution of labor markets in Spanish America. They were an example to the enslaved and free people about what freedom might mean in economic and legal or political terms. Additionally, they were objects of state legislation that sought to control potential laborers. In that sense, then, including them and the Andean region into the history of 19th century slavery and anti-slavery is an important contribution of this study. Moreover, the demographic, demographic composition of Gran Colombia is itself an interesting laboratory 
for exploring the differences between places as dissimilar as Ecuador and Venezuela, because Ecuador had the largest population of indigenous people in Gran Colombia, while Venezuela had the most significant and growing population of free people uh, of color, or pardos, as they are called in Venezuela. So to sum up, this transnational project on slavery and freedom within emergent Latin American nation states will expand current liberal definitions of freedom that lie at the base of abolitionist studies that privilege the British, French, North American, and later Brazilian and Spanish Caribbean abolitionist movements in the 19th century. It will complement and challenge historiographic uh, scholarship in three ways. First, while the majority of studies about abolitionism privilege the Anglo and French contexts, I will join recent scholarship that is recovering the history of anti-slavery in the Spanish Atlantic world. However, my work will depart from these few works that have examined Spanish and Spanish-American anti-slavery history, focusing only in the Spanish Caribbean during the late 19th century, and I will look at the Spanish mainland between the years of 1821 and 54, also establishing connections between Gran Colombia pro and anti-slavery forces in the wider Atlantic world. Second, instead of depicting the end of slavery in Gran Colombia as a process centered either on the elites or the enslaved, I will locate early freedom in the lives of free blacks articulating their legal and political struggles to the study of abolitionist movements and legislation. And lastly, while most history of slavery in Latin America reproduce a period periodization that I see established in Frank Tannenbaum's uh, classic Slave and Citizen, and this periodization privileges either slave societies or post-emancipation societies, this work will illustrate why the slow end of slavery between 1821 and 54 needs to be taken into account as a relevant process on its own. Okay, so I would really love to hear your comments uh, or questions to, to what I have presented and, and laid out. Thanks.